Hi Spring fans! In this installment of Spring Tips, we're going to go ahead and look at distributed tracing. We're going to do so in terms of uh, the Open Zipkin project. Distributed tracing, in theory, is very simple. What we want to do is to correlate the quest from one uh, service to another. So as a message arrives at one node and then proceeds to another and to another and to another, we want to be able to mark in time somewhere that that message has been received and that has been perpetuated uh, on down the line. Uh, this sounds like it could be fairly simple, right? In theory it sounds very simple, but it actually turns out to be quite a bear. Uh, some people have attempted to solve this in terms of logging, right? You have a, a unique identifier that gets perpetuated along with every message uh, or every request. That unique identifier is a, is a trace ID, and as long as you log that out, you can then sort of sift through the logs later on and uh, sort of ascertain where that message has arrived or where that message has been in the course of its uh, progression through the system. That certainly has some benefits and that works to a point. Of course, in order to make that work, you have to trap everywhere, every possible conceivable place in the system where a message may exit or en enter into the system and uh, be sure to add logic to either uh, recognize a message that already has a uh, trace ID or if it's absent a trace ID to then uh, give it a trace ID and then be sure to perpetuate that down the chain. So for all the types of requests into the system, be they over HTTP or HTTPS or if they're um, reactive and asynchronous or if they're synchronous, if they're messaging centric, Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ or whatever, everywhere you have a message that moves through the system, you need to be able to affix an ID and then perpetuate it uh, in a consistent way. Add to that extra dimension that in some cases you have uh, different languages, different per, you know different um, platforms. The dimensions of uh, of, of complexity become uh, overwhelming after a point, right? So what we're going to talk about today is uh, an abstraction inside of uh, Spring Cloud called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Sleuth. Sleuth, of course, ref you know in English it describes somebody who's a, a detective, somebody who finds clues, right? So. Uh, Sleuth is a dis generic abstraction. It has at its heart the concept of a trace. A trace describes the aggregate journey from A to, to Z or A to Z of a, uh, of a message in a system. As messages proceed from one node to another, they create new um, spans. So if you have uh, one message that goes through four, four nodes, you'll have a corresponding number of spans, maybe four spans, and one trace per all four of those spans, right? So you'll have one trace and multiple spans for any given request. Uh, and uh, that's the basic domain model. Now, this domain model, this this uh, sort of view of the of the uh, world of tracing is so ubiquitous that's actually the underpinning of an attempt to standardize, uh, not necessarily the API, but the, um, the language and the concepts of distributed tracing. That's called the Open Tracing Initiative. Now, Open Tracing, uh, has uh, it was started by one of the folks who worked on the Google Dapper paper, which is a uh, the originator, if you know, sort of the the granddaddy of distributed tracing as we know it today, and uh, on which uh, Zipkin itself is is based, right? So this is a this is an ideal, right? We're hoping to get here. We're hoping to have a vendor neutral open standard for distributed tracing. Uh, right now, in practice, uh, this doesn't quite work uh, as it should, right? You can't you can't Take a, a, a open tracing implementation, add it to your application, and then have it produce uniform traces uh, consistently across different languages. Um, Zipkin, on the other hand, uh, does for some of the implementations are already feature that right. So remember, Zipkin itself is it just is it sort of a database. It's a database that's meant to store trace information. So uh, there are different clients for Zipkin. What we're going to talk about today is the client that uh, the implementation that ships with Spring Cloud Sleuth as an implementation of Spring Cloud Sleuth. In theory, you could plug in others, but there's this core SPI of which one is a uh, our Zipkin support. Okay. So, in order to make this work, we're going to need a Zipkin server. Okay. Say Zipkin service. Uh, we want to actually have the API itself and a user interface. Right. So that we're going to add both to that. We'll hit generate. Then we're going to build a client. This will just have the web support and the Zipkin client support. And we'll get rid of the server bits here. We don't need that. We don't need the user interface. All right. And we'll have a service. Whatever that was, a service. Here we go. 
click generate and uh, open up the client here open up the zipkin server okay open open and open So let's get the Zipkin server up and running first. The first thing we need to do is to specify a few properties. We want this thing to run in port uh, 9411. Now, Zipkin is a, an API. There are several different ways you can you can talk to the API. The most direct, of course, is just to use REST, and that's what we're going to do in this example. You could also uh, asynchronously deliver messages to a Zipkin um, stream server. Right? I could have elected back on the Spring initializer to add a uh, module that supported accepting Spring uh, Cloud Stream uh, curried or marshaled rather uh, uh, messages, right? This is span information over messages delivered using any Spring Cloud Stream binder, be it rather Q or Apache Kafka or, or whatever, right? So we're going to run this in port 9411. That's a common default for Zipkin. And if you have that, then you don't have to tell the clients on which node the, uh, the service uh, lives. And then we need to actually activate the Zipkin server. Now, you may have noticed that this is not a Spring Cloud um, annotation. This is actually in the zipkin.server package in the IO zipkin.java uh, module from the Open Zipkin project, right? The Zipkin server itself is built and uh, delivered using Spring Boot. So it's actually the Open Zipkin project uh, is, is, is a, it features a Spring Boot based API and a lot of code, but it should be very familiar to anybody who's uh, used Spring Boot or Spring Cloud, uh, what's going on here, right? So we have a Zipkin server. We have that. We can go ahead and start it up on port 9411. And now it's up to us to build a client and a service. So let's see what we have here. We have the client, although the client doesn't seem to be all that sure about itself here. So we'll restart it. And there's this. Delete it all. Oh, there we go. So good. So in our client, we're going to have a simple endpoint, and uh, we'll just trigger a call to another node. Uh, so here we go. Request mapping, get mapping, hi, string hi, and we're going to call another service using a REST template. So I'm going to define a bean of type REST template. So remember, the REST template is a as a uh, sort of seam in the application. It's a com it's a component that will send messages uh, and requests to other nodes. So we need to give Spring Cloud Sleuth a chance to intercept requests that have been made from this REST template. So when Spring Cloud Sleuth sees this bean, it will configure an intercept for us to automatically uh, trace the messages that have been made from that REST template. So uh, make sure you configure it as a bean as opposed to using it as just a, a private you know, variable or something like that. Otherwise, Spring Cloud Sleuth won't be able to see that bean and it won't know to configure it for you. So this dot rest template dot uh, get for entity and we're going to call HTTP localhost 8081 hi. Okay, we're just going to get the data back and uh, we want the body here. So this is a very simple example. Obviously, I'm I could make this a bit easier if I were using the uh, the Spring Cloud Discovery client. I had that had that plugged in to talk to Eureka or something like this. But for now, it just it suffices to know we're going to call another node on port 8081. That's going to be our service implementation. We'll originate the node here on the client. Uh, this Spring Cloud Sleuth will know that this is the client because we're going to give it a name. This is the same name that's used for service registration and discovery. And we can kick that off. Now let's go ahead and look at that service implementation. Right? So service application, uh, REST controller. Okay. We'll say at Get mapping, hi, string hi, return, hello. Okay, so there's our, our uh, ever so sophisticated uh, service implementation. We'll run this on port 8081, and we'll give this a name, service, so as to make it easier to understand what's happening. So we can run this now. 
our client. This is the, uh, the client. It should be up and running. Here on port 8080. And localhost 8080i. There's a service implementation on 8081. So we're all off to the races. Let's go ahead and kick off a request. Uh, Localhost 8081. That's because that service is still spinning up. There we go. So the service is just spinning up. Uh, now it's working. So we have now a request that has gone from 8080 all the way to 8081 and then back. Um, we can see the results confirmed here. Let's see what the Zipkin server that was spun up has to say about that. Now the Zipkin server is running on port 9411. You can see that it is where both uh, both nodes, the client and the service. If we click on service, for example, we can see the particular uh, endpoints, all the particular egress and ingress points in the um, in that particular node, so we can say I want to see all the requests pertaining to the HTTP high endpoint. Hit find trace and it shows that we made this request that had uh, a couple of spans. And we can see here that the uh, the, the request originated at, at, at the client at the going to the HTTP high endpoint and then uh, maybe five milliseconds, no sorry, uh, maybe uh, uh, five milliseconds later it went to the uh, service where it was going to the HTTP high endpoint on that node and we can see the waterfall graph here. If you had if you had ten different requests, you'd see a much more interesting sort of uh, graph of the uh, of the, uh, the conveyance of that message across the different nodes. We can click on each one of these, and we get some interesting information. This information down here, all this is uh, these are called tags, and the tags give you extra metadata, of, uh, extra context about the request itself. Here we can see that it was an HTTP request. We can see the HTTP verb used the host to which the message, uh, you know, uh, was sent. Uh, and if we have it, we give you Spring-specific information, and you can emit and capture custom tags as well, right? So you can inject a, a span using Spring Cloud Sleuth. You can ca capture custom tags as well. Uh, you can use this facility to add things that you can use to correlate a a, a request, you know, over HTTP, for example. Uh, to a business transaction, maybe you can have the order ID or the, uh, you know, the customer ID or whatever you want. But um, uh, make no mistake, this is not about warehousing. We're not going to use this information to understand what Jane did on the website five years ago. This is all about online telemetry. So most organizations don't keep uh, uh, most, you know, they don't keep all their data, and if they do, they don't keep it for more than uh, a certain sort of window, window to uh, amount of time, right? A, a, a small amount of time during which they can. Uh, keep it and analyze it if they need to, and then they excise it, they, they archive it off or just throw it away, right? You're not going to use this for, for, you know, warehousing. This is all about online telemetry. Uh, but in that regard, um, it's very useful. A lot of teams don't know what the right granularity is, right? So Spring Cloud uh, Sleuth, by default, I think, um, doesn't, uh, it keeps just a small subset of the requests. I forget what that percentage is. Uh, but you can change that. You can change how many uh, requests are retained by changing the, uh, let's see, sleuth. There we go, sample percentage. So the default sample percentage is one out of every 10 requests. Uh, so it's 0.1. You can change that by making it, you know, one, right? So that way it's everybody, 100%. Uh, this is a property, and if you have this property on both sides, then both sides will automatically record every single uh, message. You can also record your own or register your own custom sampler bean, right? So uh, sampler is the callback interface in Sleuth, and we can say return new always sampler, for example, and that gives you uh, something that will that'll sample every single request that's observed. The sampler's contract is very simple. It just is sampled given a span. So you, you can return yes or no. You can you know, it's based on arbitrary things like the, uh, is, is Mercury in retrograde, for example, whatever you want, right? All right, so this has been a very simple look at um, Spring Cloud Sleuth. Remember that this abstraction is there under Spring Cloud, so in most cases you can add the, uh, the uh, Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin uh, dependency to your class path, stand up a Zipkin server on the side, 
uh, and all of the things that you do in your in a typical Spring Cloud application, be it over uh, Apache Kafka or Rabin Q or you know anything over Spring Cloud Stream or uh, anything to do with REST or the Zool microproxy or the uh, the Fane uh, REST client or the REST template, all these <clears throat> all these sort of ingress and egress points in the application in a typical Spring Cloud application are automatically instrumented for you, and they will all honor and observe the properties or the samplers that you can configure. As for the server itself, uh, you know, I've just stood up a very simple API and it's stateless. Right now the data is just stored in memory, uh, which is, you know, simple enough for a good demo, but you can also configure a data source and point it to, for example, MySQL. Uh, so this is a very common option as well. There's work being done to make Elasticsearch another persistence uh, story for uh, for Zipkin itself. Uh, so, okay, with all that, uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, I'll see you next time.